Rebooting an entire series is never an easy thing to do. Reboots only become necessary when a series has become dormant for years or has become so different from what the original vision was that the games have become borderline unrecognizable. 2015 marked one of the strangest reboots from a big name racing series that I've ever seen. Ghost Games themselves made a game in which was true to Need for Speed's core DNA and Rivals. A game in which was not perfect, but with some changes it could have been an incredible foundation for a truly great racer. So what Ghost Games do next? Completely ditch everything that made Rivals great, and in an attempt to make a whole new tuner and story-focused revision of the series, ended up coming across as a half-baked attempt at an open-world racer. And now that Need for Speed is seemingly going through another reboot again, with Unbound and Criterion taking over the reins again, let's look at what Need for Speed 2015 taught us all on how not to reboot a series. Need for Speed's issues all originate from one main theme, style over substance. It's something that under first impressions, it's easy to like what you see. The graphics are pretty, the open world has some decent character to it. There is some semblance of car culture being a prominent topic of the story. But as you play, it's easy to see that so much of this is all skin deep. Let's start with the whole nouveau underground theme of the game. I feel like this was a decision that was made late into development or really just not thought out well. By far the most important thing when it comes to open world racers is making a map that suits the handling style of the game. It's why I speak so highly of Seacrest County in Hot Pursuit 2010. There isn't an inch of that map that didn't have racing and fun in mind. And even in Rivals, most of this DNA was still heavily apparent. For 2015, however, things made a heavy change for the worse. The map itself looks massive when you drive around, but as you start to experience it all, and when you open up the map and see how little of it is actually drivable, this is where issues start to come into play. Why can we not go into that huge city? Why is almost half of the show map completely unexplorable? And in regards to what we do have, I don't absolutely hate it. It's just painfully obvious that the art style was more important than actual gameplay. Take the main suburbs and city portions which are packed full of 90 degree corners which don't fit the physics of this game in the slightest. Or a section which is really unique to 2015, the mountain switchbacks up past Franklin Terrace. Can you imagine how amazing it would be to have roads this tight and technical in a game with a half decent physics model? Because in 2015, especially if you built your cars for understeer, oh, Sorry, I meant grip. These are nothing but a royal pain to drive on. The whole style change was, I believe, done to explore its exploration, but with how boring the side activities are in this game, and in a map this tiny, it's just puzzling. Now I will say this, there's a part of me that enjoys parts of this game's style as a guilty pleasure, except for one glaring issue. Why Ghost decided to give this game GTA 5 graphics mod syndrome with the whole if the ground is wet the game looks better mentality is beyond me. It's a cheap way to add some easy character to an otherwise boring map. Now on that same subject of style over substance, let's move on to cars. A full opinion disclaimer here, I prefer my cars not looking like an aborted Transformers clone, so I'm not exactly sold on the concept of customization in 2015. It was also marketed that there would be an unseen amount of customization in this game, only for the cars that I'd chosen my playthrough to have virtually no options. Let's make one thing clear, I'm not against customization here, but I feel a lot of people missed on something really crucial. Customization is not a selling feature of a video game, but it's treated as so here. 2015 was a vastly inferior game to most other in the series. Poor race design, a mediocre map, horrible AI, and even worse police and chases. And in replacement of that, Ghost decided to just add in the ability to make your own fun with customization and building your own cars to distract from the reality that the rest of the game is so painfully lackluster and poorly designed. Heading to the garage, let's talk about the actual cars themselves. Need for Speed had a pretty small list when it launched with around 50 cars, but the vast majority of the list were all new to the series, so I'm not completely upset about that. The performance tuning options here are pretty average, but there are really strange things such as components completely unrelated affecting your horsepower, and the ability to build your cars more towards a drift or a grip style was a fine concept if it actually worked. Grip builds are completely useless as drifting is still the fastest way around most corners. Physics are a major complaint for me regarding 2015. I mentioned the obvious earlier, which was that the physics clearly were not made for this map, but that isn't the only issue. I love how Break to Drift was roasted in supercar era games, yet it's literally the fastest way around corners here. I don't understand what Ghost was trying to go for with this game's physics. The past games had them nailed down to a T. Ghost even did it themselves in Rivals. So what was the point in going half-half with this handling model? It doesn't satisfy the Break to Drift camp, or the more realistic physics camp. It's just puzzling. 
and crash cams which fit games like Hot Pursuit and Rivals are out of place here. Far too sensitive to the point where so much as tapping a wall will take you out and leave you in a stuck animation. And on the same trend of downgrades, what on earth happened to the whole risk versus reward aspect from Rivals? There is zero reason to get into cop chases as the rewards are so poor. And let alone you actually look forward to an actual legit chase, because you can quite literally drive right next to them for minutes at a time without them doing anything to you. When a police chase initiates mid-race, it has zero intimidation factor unless you have the IQ of a Sonic fan. It's a shame because police are such a massive part of Need for Speed, basically the only racing series these days that has any sort of a police presence. And this game set a baseline in which the newest games are still struggling with. Before I get into the campaign, I think it's time to bring up one of the most oddball choices for 2015. Everyone threw a little hissy-fissy when Online Only was introduced in Rivals, yet it's debatably even worse here, as the servers are even worse than in Rivals, and they can interrupt story cutscenes when they're down for maintenance. I don't know how there is such a double standard here. Online Only is stupid in every single game that it's put in, and to call it game-breaking in Rivals and not complain about it at all in 2015 is just plain ignorance from the Need for Speed community. Now with that out of the way, oh ho ho. Let's get into the good stuff. Need for Speed stories are a pretty hit or miss. You have The Run, which is completely off the rails action movie goodness. Games that don't have any story at all with Hot Pursuit. And then you have Payback. 2015 shows a very strange route in terms of its main campaign. A bunch of branching storylines focusing on separate disciplines. This, like most things in 2015, could have been an interesting concept, except for the fact that each discipline meant literally nothing, and were virtually indistinguishable apart from cutscenes. Don't worry, I'll get to those in a second. Campaign and car progression in 2015 is something that I think is done relatively well. Start off in slower car, work your way up to faster car, yada yada yada. But what kills it for me is just how uninspired the gameplay is. Apart from drift events, it's all just races and time trials. A major downgrade in event variety from the past games. And especially when talking about the difficulty, you could practically play this game with your eyes closed and still breeze through it all. And because there's no difficulty options, it really bothers those like me who enjoy games that don't constantly hold your hand. And to add on to that, your opponents are some of the least intelligent AI ever put into a racing game, and have rubber banding so strong it gives this guy Sonic a run for Frontiers. his mind. I also really don't like the implementation of the phone system. Why on earth do people call you mid race? And this isn't a rare thing, your phone is constantly going off throughout the story, and it gets really annoying at times. It doesn't help that the game doesn't pause, so if you ever want to read something you have to actually pull over or be in the garage to read it right. Let me preface something before getting into the story though. The cutscenes and storyline in 2015 have easily surpassed the so bad it's good territory. I would choose this FMV cheesy style over the likes of say, anything Forza is doing these days in a heartbeat. 2015 left a huge impression on you. Not necessarily in the best way, but at least it was memorable. I'd choose memorable and cheesy over forgettable and even worse with Forza. And to show you what I mean, let's look at these five storylines and why they're kind of a guilty pleasure. The speed story is all about you and this mongrel Spike getting the attention of Magnus Walker. Spike is the one who introduced you to the main crew and gets a little jelly when they all start wanting to hang out with you instead of him. The story is all about Spike trying to get that attention back. Spike is the only character who I actively dislike in this game. His jealousy is written so over the top and he's just kind of a creep at times. Now with the Magnus Walker thing, I do enjoy how completing each storyline rewards you with what could be looked at as a boss vehicle that you couldn't get otherwise. So that's a neat touch, but all of these stories kind of end the exact same way with, oh we're just gonna celebrate at a bar, let's have some drinks guys, woohoo. Style is all about you and yee ass haircut Manu getting into the Gymkhana scene to attract Ken Block. I kind of like Manu simply because of the spike slander that he dishes out on the regular, and the fact that a guy like him uses a Miata for Gymkhana. The best part of this story by far is when Manu spins the block on Spike and launches him directly into the floor which is oddly satisfying. Manu and the player set up their own Gymkhana and Spike how are you jealous of everything? Oddly enough the end of this story is more about shrimp tacos than Gymkhana and yeah, that, that isn't a joke. The build story with Amy and Nakai-san is probably the one I like the most. Amy's shop is scarily accurate to all of the shops I've seen and been in, and I think she's probably the most likable character in the game. 
But Amy, why are you redlining a cold engine? Stop! Amy somehow builds a 180SX, which can outrun 900 horsepower F40s with ease, which is a bit silly goofy, but plot reasons be bothering. Amy's story also required you to try different things with your car and build them in certain ways for certain events, which is a welcome challenge from the others, which let you basically do whatever you want. Travis somehow yoinks Nakasan's master build, so Amy can just go around and drive it, but after this, nothing really happens. It's the story I like the most, but unfortunately it falls so flat because of the ending, which is the same as every single other one. Second to last is Robin's crew focus story. She's trying to get the attention of a risky devil, and the events in her story are focused on drift trains and other team focused events. Robin herself is a little crazy, and not in the good way. They somehow threw a FNAF jump scare in this game, followed by the single worst dialogue section in any racing game ever. We gotta get more street cred. Gotta bust up that chassis. Yep. Destroy those wheels. Bang limiter and shred those tires. Yeah. <laughs> Spike, can you stop showing up in every single story, Casalti? Oh my god. Crew has probably the most disappointing story because there is no sort of a reward car for finishing it. The only one without one. The final story is Outlaw, in which the introductory cutscene has the stupidest exchange of sentences in the entire game. Look at us. When did our balls drop off? <laughs> for real. Man, you never had balls. Oh, really? Then why are you busting all this time, man? Huh? Yo ass. Yeah, I don't know either. Travis is a lot more prevalent in this than all of the other stories. I don't know how to feel about him. It's like he's trying way too hard to come off serious, but he just gives me serial killer vibes. And this outlaw story would be fun if the police in this game were not completely brain dead and borderline non-existent throughout the map. But at least you get a reward at the end of it, which is something. Now, if you finish all of the storylines, you get the easiest final race in Need for Speed history, racing all of the icons of Ventura Bay, alongside a special final cutscene, where oh, 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 we get to see the main character's fate. I've been playing as a furry- to finish off my thoughts on Need for Speed 2015, I have to mention probably the most important issue I have with the game. The Need for Speeds before 2015 all felt unique from each other. Hot Pursuit, The Run, Most Wanted 2012, and Rivals. They didn't feel similar to each other at all. Different physics, different car lists, changes to core gameplay, yet after 2015 released, both Payback and Heat just piggybacked off of 2015's core structure, which wouldn't be so bad if 2015 wasn't so inherently flawed. Go switch to releasing games every two years as well, instead of every year with the past games that I mentioned. So they had more development time to make changes, and instead of fixing the issues with their game's structure, they dressed it up even more by having longer stories and more car customization and open world activities to distract from the fact that, well, the cars were mostly the same, events and racing were still mediocre at best, and focus more on copying what the competitors were doing instead of doing its own thing. I only hope that with Unbound, Criterion doesn't repeat the same mistakes, but only time will tell. Do I hate Need for Speed 2015? No, but to me, it doesn't do anything better than its competitors. And because of how it set Need for Speed up for the future, I think it is the peak of mediocrity. Thank you so much for watching all the way to the end of the video. At the time of recording, we are just a hundred people away from 10,000 subscribers. So if you aren't subscribed yet, I would so much appreciate it. And if you are, let me know some ideas in the comments for a celebration of this massive milestone. And with all of that out of the way, I will see you all in the next video.